And I say again, good morning. <laughs> I know it's a little dreary and nasty outside, but everybody's here. We've got warm spirits. That all, that's all that matters to us today. I think by the weather people said this is about the first time for our measurable snowfall this time of year. I got about a foot or more at my house. I don't know how y'all got it, but shoveling this morning was not a very good chore. But before we begin our services, just a few administrative announcements. Uh, number one, if you have a need of it, we do have an attended nursery. Now this hallway to my left, your right, at the end of the hallway at the very back of the building, that's for ages zero to three. We do also have an unattended nursery out the opening there and up the stairs to the left if you have need of that as well. Visitors, we are delighted that you are here with us. You're our honored guest. We appreciate you being here. And we do have a little potluck going on after services this morning, if you'll stick around and enjoy a meal with us. But at least stick around and give us time, enough time to get acquainted with you. If you would, for our visitors, members alike, there's blue cards on the back of the pew in front of you. If you have any information you want to communicate to the preachers or the elders, you can fill that out for our members. For our visitors, there's a place on the back where you can put your information so we have a record of your attendance with us. Also, another load of administrative announcements. You know we're using a karaoke machine this morning. Along with this little snowstorm that came through, there's also a power failure, and it's got our audio AV system kind of messed up. But it's not a problem. We'll get through service. There's no problem at all. We praise the Lord just like we always do. If nothing further, if you would, please bow your heads. We're opening our service with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we come before thee now so thankful that we indeed we can assemble here, Father, and we can worship thee in a way that's in accordance to your word. We just pray, Father, you be with each and every one of us that we send our minds and concentrate our hearts on what's being said and done here this morning and all things that we do are acceptable in thy sight. Father, we thank thee for the blessings of life that we enjoy each and every day, especially the spiritual blessings that we lay up for, in store for us in heaven by our faithful obedience to your word. Father, we come before thee now with, with a hurting hearts over the death of our brother Elwin's sister that has just passed away, and especially, Father, on, on behalf of Roger Dunn. We just pray that you'll be with Donna, be with Jim, and be with Judy, and also Roger's family as they go through this time. Be with Eldon and his family, Father, that they can find the true peace and comfort that they can only find in thee. We ask that you be with all of our, with Grady as he presents our lesson to us this morning, Father, that he presents it in such a manner that all present can grasp the true meaning that's there for us. Father, we just pray that you look at our prayer list. There are many that are there. We lift up their names before thee and just ask that they can, be, they can recover from their surgeries or from their illnesses and return through the fold here. Continue to guide us in all that we do, Father. We just pray that we will let your word guide us in all that we do. Through Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'm guessing that we're going to be a little bit light on voices this morning, so you're all going to have to pick your part and belt it out, will you? We'll start with uh, two verses of To God Be the Glory. Mm. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son. Who yielded his life an atonement for sin And opened the life gate that all may go in Praise the Lord, praise the Lord Let the earth hear his voice Praise the Lord, praise the Lord Let the people rejoice All come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. O oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, to every believer the promise of God, the vilest offenders who truly Let the 
people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Amen. Very good. We're going to sing three verses of one day. And then we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, Dwelt among men, my example is he. Living he loved me, dying he saved me. Buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified, freely forever. One day he's come. One day they led him up Calvary's mountain. One day they nailed him to die on the tree. Suffering anguish, despised and rejected. Bearing our sins, my Redeemer is he. Freely forever, one day he's coming, oh glorious day. One day the grave could conceal him no longer, one day the stone rolled away from the door, then he arose, oh had conquered now is ascended my Lord evermore living he loved me dying he saved me buried he carried my sins far away rising he justified freely one day he's coming, oh glorious day. Good morning. <clears throat> why my phone did that. Um, if you haven't gotten the items you need for the Lord's Supper, then please raise your hand and we'll make sure you get those. Also, because we no longer pass the baskets and Many times we take advantage of those uh, moments when that basket is being passed to, to reflect on the importance of the Lord's Supper. After we partake of the bread, I'll sit down for a few moments that uh, we can reflect and then uh, get back up and we will then talk about the blood of Christ. The Hebrews letter is complicated. I wish that I had time that I could explain everything in full, but I wanted to uh, read some more. Last week I read from the Hebrew letter. I want to read some more starting in Hebrews, the 10th chapter. 
starting in verse 9. Jesus said, Behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first, in other words, the first covenant, in order to establish the second, the second covenant. By this will, we have been sanctified, or we have been consecrated, through the offering of, of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And then the Hebrews writer goes on and explains what he means. Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But he, having offered one sacri sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified or those who are consecrated, us. With that in mind, let us pray together about the offering of the body of Christ. Father, we're blessed this Lord's day to come and partake of this sad memorial, to reflect on the sad occasion that Jesus had to be nailed to the cross, that he had to be shamed and made naked before everybody to see, humiliated. But we also know, Father, that that was your purpose. From the very beginning, you knew that we would need this. We ask, Lord, that you'll be with us as we reflect on these things and help us, Father, to look forward to every Lord's Day, every opportunity when we can come together and partake of this memorial of that sad day. And in the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. And let us again join in prayer as we pray for the blood of Jesus that covers us, hiding our sins from God. Father, we have much to be thankful for. But most of all, Father, we're thankful for what we do not see. Thankful for what is a promise what is a hope? The hope of eternal salvation, which has been made possible because our sins are hidden from you. The hope of our salvation has been made possible because we are the brothers of Christ, joint heirs with him, your children. We ask, Lord, that you be with us as we, again, with mixed emotions, sadness, but yet rejoicing that we have relationship, have this relationship with you. And in the name of our Savior, we pray. Amen. Sing one verse of He Loves Me. Mm -hmm. 
Why did the Savior heaven leave and come to earth below, where men His grace would not receive, because He loves me so? He loves me, loves me, He loves me, this I he gave himself to die for me because he loves me so. We've just prayed together about spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts that cannot be excelled or equaled. The gift of salvation, the gift of hope, the gift of eternity. But now is the time for us to participate in an act of faith. Do we really believe when Jesus said that when we give back to the Lord, and when we give to the Lord, that He'll give back to us as a sack of grain, not just offered to us, but shaken? Packed down, refilled, shaken, packed down, refilled. That's an act of faith. Of course, the promise is not for us that we're going to be enrich ourselves in this world. The promise is that, as mentioned, that we cannot even begin to equal the gift of eternity that God has offered for us. Let us pray together as we consider these things we will, when we would give back to the Lord some of what he's given us. Father, it's easy for us to, as we go through the daily moments of our lives, to forget, to lose our concentration on what you've done for us. Yet we come together on this Lord's day to be reminded that this is a time for us to consider how we would place you, first of all, that we would offer to you the best of what we have, not to place, your, not to place this opportunity on the back burner, but to, to put it forth first. And then we will mold all of our financial needs around that. We ask, Lord, that you'll help us to be faithful in all the aspects of our lives. But help us, Father, to be faithful here. And in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Let us bow. Dear Lord, we, we come to you again and we just thank you so much for all your many blessings. We're thankful for the beautiful snow and the moisture that we receive from it. We're thankful, Lord, for each one who is present this morning. We're so thankful for the visitors that we have. And we ask that you would be with them and, and be with them as they continue their journey, that they'll get to their journeys in safely. We're just so thankful, Lord, for all those who are here. We ask you to be with the ones who are not here. Be with those who might be sick. Be with those who are in need of your, your watch over them, Lord, and help them to be here at the next appointed time. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to be with us this morning as what we say and do will be in accordance with your will. We pray, Lord, you just continue to guide us and direct us in all that we do, that we are pleasing you, not pleasing man. We pray, Lord, that you would be with the leaders of our country, that they continue to do the things that are right, that they do look to you for their guidance, that we will continue to have peace, that we'll continue to be able to worship you without harm. We ask that you would be with those over in Israel at this time and watch over them and care for them. Be with those, Lord, who are persecuting them, that they will 
rethink what they do and, and look to you, Lord, for their guidance. We ask, Lord, that you would be with those who are in the mission fields at this time, that you will strengthen them and help them and be able to do the things that they need to do to bring more souls unto you. We pray that you would be with us right here in Colorado Springs, that our influence on others may show them your love for them and that they will come unto you if it be thy will. We pray, Lord, that you would just continue to guide us in all that we do. Forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Pray. Amen. <clears throat>
that's not working this morning. And we'll have them do a complete redo, and we'll be better next Sunday. None of that affects our ability to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Now then, there on the screen, it's bigger on the side monitors, but you see that aggravating Rubik's Cube. And believe it or not, once upon a time, I put that thing together. Handed it over to show somebody, they messed it up, and they said, do it again, and I couldn't. And you know, there are some problems that we work through, and then a little time goes by, and we have to work through it all over again. And there are some passages in the Bible that are so different from our times, from our culture from our expectations, and the way they lived then, and what the law was then, and what the expectations were then, so alien to us, and they're a real challenge to us as we read through them. And so this morning, we've got another installment in one of my ever once in a while, now and then series that I call Puzzling Passages. Looking back, started that in 2017, and this is lesson number 10. So we don't look at these all that often, but so far we've looked at, oh, demon possession. We've looked at the witch of Endor. Did Samuel really come back from Sheol and stand there and come back from the dead? We've looked at the woman, the woman of Canaan that the Lord seems to talk roughly to, even the dogs. And you'll remember that puzzling passage. And we've looked at others through the years. And this morning, we're going to look at the narrative of a man by the name of Phinehas and what he did And what can we learn from it? I would tell you that this is one of the passages in the Bible that critics, skeptics, unbelievers, well, let's just call it for what it is, enemies. They have taken and they have used, they have warped and exaggerated much of the features of the story. And they parade it as an exhibit of how awful the Bible is. And the God of the Bible, you won't find many statements just as shocking and disturbing as this from Richard Dawkins, a book that he wrote in 2006. And this is the God that you and I adore. And he says, well, this God doesn't like women, doesn't like homosexuals, he's racist, he calls even little children to be put to death, he told Israel to slaughter whole populations and put them to the sword, he commanded parents to put their children to death. And you'll recall there in the Levitical Code how that the rebellious son was to be stoned. And he says that's a brutal thing. He caused plagues to break out upon people. He's a God who thinks he's really something like sovereign. And that's a sign of a mental disturbance. He enjoys inflicting pain on others. He's capricious. He just does what he does without rhyme or reason. He hurts people coming and going, and the God of the Bible is a bully. Well, you remember Jesus said that every idle word will meet those in judgment. I shudder to think what someone who says this, who writes this, who believes this, I shudder to think about that standing before the great white throne of God. 
But you know, even so, there are passages in the Bible like this story of Phinehas, and when we read them, we might scratch our heads. What's going on here? And this seems awfully peculiar. And the idea, the notion that a young man seeing something and picking up his javelin, his spear, and taking, what, justice in his own hands, going in and there and in cold blood, puncturing both the man and the woman together, and it's something to be celebrated? Well, that's not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That doesn't appear to be the story of the New Testament. The story of grace and mercy and love and compassion, and yet this is told and given to us. And so what do you and I do with it? We know what someone like Mr. Dawkins would do. I believe he's still alive. He's in his early 80s. We know his reaction, but what's your reaction? What's my reaction? And we might be excused for scratching our head and saying, well, maybe I need just a little help in wading through this. I like what Mr. Kaiser wrote. He says, this is one of the most bizarre episodes in Israel's long wilderness wanderings. And so even from a believer's standpoint, Here's an Old Testament narrative, and we wonder about it. Well, the first thing that we would want to do this morning is notice the context of the story. And do you have your Bibles? And you might be looking at the book of Numbers. We don't preach from Numbers a whole lot, every now and then. But the book of Numbers, and you might go back and begin in chapter 22. We're not going to read it. We're not going to go verse by verse. But this just helps us get a running start before we get to chapter 25. In Numbers 22, Israel, after they came out of Egypt, after they rebelled at Kadesh Barnea, after they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, they're coming up and they're almost ready to go into the land of promise. And they're coming into contact with people for the first time, the Moabites and the Midianites. The Moabites were a bit more settled. The Midianites were a nomadic wandering people. But you can see there in Numbers chapter 22 that the Moabites and the Midianites, and depending on how your English translation words it, they were filled with dread, with terror. The people that we've been hearing about these last few decades, they came out of Egypt and they left Egypt in ruin. And then they came across the Amorite king, Sihon and Og, and completely annihilated them and humiliated them in their conquest. And now these people have come to our region, and they're marching through. Are we next on their hit list? And they said that these people, they're just like ox out in the pasture licking up the grass. And the imagery would be, here's a full green pasture of grass, but after the ox move through, there's hardly anything left. And so Moab and the Midianites are terrified at the appearance of Moses and Israel, and the king of Moab says, I have an idea. Let's send for a seer, for a sorcerer. For a holy man. And let him put a curse on the people that are terrifying us. And so you'll recall they sent for a man named Balaam who lived all the way over by the Euphrates River. And if you've got maps in the back of your Bible. 
And if you look at the Jordan River along about where Jericho is, on the other side, the east side, that's where Israel was camping. And then if you pull out and you find the Euphrates River, it's hundreds of miles away. So this man Balaam has a spectacular reputation that whoever he blesses, they are blessed. And whoever he curses, they are cursed. And so Balak, the king of Moab, says, I'll pay you well. You come and curse this people for me. And then chapters 23 and 24, there Balaam goes up on a high place and looks down over where all the children of Israel are camping. And he opens his mouth, but each time a blessing comes out. And you'll remember how that Balaam wanted to go. The Lord told him no. Balaam says again, I want to go. And the Lord says, okay, but you can only say the words that I give you. Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 15 explains why Balaam really wanted to do the bidding of the king of Moab. And Peter says it was greed. He wanted that money. He wanted that paycheck. He wanted that bonus. And so he wanted to do, and the Lord wouldn't let him save the curse. And then we find chapter 25 where we are. But before we go back there, skip a few pages ahead to chapter 31. Chapter 31 of Numbers, verse 16. We read how that Balaam couldn't curse Israel, but he had another plan. And he advised, he counseled the Moabites and the Midianites, you let your young women go down into the Israelite camp. They're young, they're beautiful. They're desirable. They're faithful to their families and they're faithful to their own gods. You send your women down among the Israelites and that will be their undoing. And sure enough, we find that the women of Midian and Moab went down into the camps of the Israelites and there were many men that were joined to them that word joint in the original is the same word that has to do with the sword hanging from the belt. It's a union. And in this instance, it's talking about the promiscuous fornication that went on among the Israelite men and the Moabite and the Midianite women. And if you look at chapter 31 and verse 8, Balaam, the mastermind, Balaam, who didn't have as much sense as his own donkey. Balaam, the one who wanted to curse Israel, but God wouldn't let him. So he undertook this subterfuge, this going around the barn way to trip up Israel. Balaam is living in the camp of the enemies of Israel, and he's killed in battle. Well, that shows us where Balaam's true loyalties lie. And so when we come to the context of Numbers 25, what's going on? Well, there's a plague in the camp. And it's worse than COVID. It's worse than the pandemic. That you and I, we know something about that. People are dying. 24,000. They're in the camp of Israel, and apparently it's a sudden thing, and it shows no sign of slackening off. And all the faithful children of Israel realize this is God's punishment. Look at here. We've been wandering 40 years in the wilderness, and we can look right over the river, and there's the promised land. We're right on the doorstep. 
And then we're unfaithful to our God in such a dramatic way. Yes, the hand of God is against us. And all the children of Israel are gathered around the tabernacle. And they're standing right outside the door that leads into the courtroom of the tabernacle. And they're weeping. They're crying. They're praying. And here comes a fellow walking down the street. And he's a prince of the tribe of Simeon. And he has on his arm a princess of Midian. And there we read about Zimri and Cosby. And here are two people and they're not hiding. Back when I was a youngster, there was a family friend that wrote songs, had a good recording contract. Other people were better singers than he was, and so he made his money when other people sang his songs. One of them was the dark end of the street. And that's where cheaters go, and that's where liars and gamblers and people, they don't want the bright glare of everybody seeing and knowing, and so they'll slip around to the dark end of the street. Well... Here are these two, one from Israel and one from Midian. And they're just parading in front of God and everybody. In the size of Moses and the children of Israel. And without shame, without any sense of embarrassment, they walk right past the tabernacle. They walk right past Moses and they go into a tent And there could hardly be a more brazen, more public display of arrogance against the law of God. That's the context. And it's a little bit different picture than Mr. Dawkins and others would represent. Here's just a few points to keep in mind. And number one, Israel was different from the United States. Colorado. Israel, God's law, was the law of the land. There wasn't really a separation between religious law and civil law. We would say that whenever the Israelite farmers were commanded to leave the corners of their field for the poor and the sick and the alien in the land to harvest. Well, that was a religious law, but it was also the law of the land. They were one and the same inseparable. That's not the way we have it today. We hope, we pray, we wish that the laws that are passed in the Denver State House and in Washington, D.C. align with God's holy truths. Sometimes they don't. And just like the apostles in the early chapters of the book of Acts, and their principled stand, we must obey God rather than men, well, there's a difference in the law of God and the laws that men may pass, but in Old Testament Israel, to break the law was both a sin and a crime at the same time. And so what we have here in Numbers 25 is just compounds the problem and how serious the matter is. And then number two, we must acknowledge just the arrogant, callous nature of it. They walked right by the meeting house, the tabernacle, where sacrifices were made, where prayers were lifted up, where God appeared and gave His instructions to Moses, and Moses sent them all through the tribe. And here's Zimra and Cosby, and they could have taken another route to that tent and carried on their personal business. 
But they chose to walk in the most public path to be seen and to be known. And then number three, here's the point that maybe we would stress. Phineas was not a hothead. He was not a vigilante. He was not someone standing by and filled with such outrage and anger that he took the law in his own hands. That's not the story that's given in Numbers chapter 25. We read there in Numbers 25 how that earlier Moses had appointed the leaders of the people and the judges of Israel in verses 4 and 5 to go through the camp and put to death those who were deserving the offenders, the lawbreakers, and still the plague in Israel. Phineas was the grandson of Aaron. That would make him what? The great nephew of Moses? He was part of the leadership family, part of the elite, one of the judges in Israel. In fact, Phineas will soon become high priest. And according to Jewish tradition, he was high priest for 19 years. A splendid young man who had already come into recognition among his own people. And so he's not just some Yehu that thought they're not going to get away with that and took it on himself to do what was right. He was part of the ones commissioned to put this evil away from the tents of Israel and to steal the plague that was raging. And if there's one thing to be noted about Phineas that remains a lesson for you and me, It's those words we have there in the yellow font. Notice one, two, three, four times in just a verse or two. And it's the word zeal. Zealous. Maybe you're reading from another translation. That's fine. The English Standard and the New American Standard, instead of zeal, they have the word jealous. Phinehas was filled with jealousy. And it was the Lord's own jealousy. And in some translations, that word is translated zeal. Sometimes it's translated jealous or jealousy. But the root meaning is one and the same. There are some things and we feel a passion for. A possessive selfish passion for. This is mine and no one else's. And that's the way the Lord expressed Himself constantly about His people Israel. And the Apostle Paul even told the church in Corinth, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. There are things that belong to the Lord that are right and pure and holy and noble. And when that is upset, well, there's a reason for the passion to be inflamed. And so here's Phineas. And it's not, well, there are numbers put in an Israelite camp. And he draws one. So he's authorized to do the punishment. He's not someone standing by that loses his head. His temper gets the best of him. So he picks up a javelin and he goes into the tent. And there's a word play in the Hebrew. He stabbed the man and the woman together. The new King James has through their bodies, which is a bit sanitized. The word is belly, and the word for belly and the bedroom part of the tent kind of sounds the same. So without me going into a great deal of detail, do you have the picture? Here's Phineas, and he's filled with the zeal of the Lord and commended for. Hundreds of years later in Psalm 106, 
The writer looks back at this sorry incident that happened right on the cusp, right on the doorstep of Israel coming into the land of promise. And that's where they joined themselves to Baal, Baal, the false god of Peor, the mountain summit there. And they provoked God to anger with their deeds. A plague broke out, but Phinehas stood up and intervened. The plague was stopped. And that was accounted to him for righteousness to all generations forevermore. So when we look at this public, this puzzling passage, no, it doesn't justify. We're walking into King Super. There are shoplifters running out. And so we take a stick or a gun or our car and we meet out justice on the spot. Well, the Bible's not going into that kind of foolishness. And anyone that reads the story of Phineas just doesn't see what's going on and the context makes clear. Here's a man of God executing the justice of God on those who break the law of God. And Phineas, as one of the leaders of God's people, is duly authorized and fully commissioned to do exactly that and notice how the Lord accounted it to him for righteousness. Well, Again, what lesson is there for you and me? Well, maybe this would be the one that would be a bit harder to put into words and to summarize in a very succinct, short way. Not my strong suit anyway. But there's a zeal. There's a passion. We are not just note-takers. We're not just observers. We're not just witnesses. We're not just entered on the roads. We're not just listed in a directory. There's a reality to our faith. And there's a burning energy and passion in our faith. Oh, there's the danger that we're sometimes way too complacent. Somebody else will do it. Or I'll do it, but I'll do it later. No, we find the New Testament description of us all, it's more like we are soldiers. And we are in a struggle. We are in a battle. And that's why the Apostle Paul urged the saints at Ephesus to pick up the whole armor of God. And he uses that word sword. Not so much in the literal sense that we go swinging and hacking and thrusting and slicing and dicing. But we're called upon to take a stand. And it's our zeal for the law of the Lord that motivates us. And others may draw back. And others may not choose to participate. But it's just like when Moses came down from Sinai and saw all the children of Israel and what they were doing. He cried out, Who is on the Lord's side? And in a similar story to that of Phinehas, we find the Levites and the others rush to his side and they begin to execute the judgment of God. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. We'll let the Lord have that role. None of us particularly would choose to be in that position. That's not the lesson from Phinehas. The lesson from Phinehas is there's right and wrong. There's a clear choice between good and evil. And in our zeal, in our jealousy... There comes the choice that we too must take. I will stand on the side of the Lord. So this morning, that's the story of Phineas. It's one of the puzzling passages, I think, in the Bible. And it's one that, while it happened long ago, 
in an entirely different set of circumstances, in a culture, in a dispensation far removed from our own, yet there's still a lesson to be learned, and the lesson is of commitment and zeal and passion that we too must display as soldiers in the army of the Lord and as disciples of the risen Christ. This morning our numbers are small. There's the weather. But yet we also come together in recognition that any time we are together, perhaps there's someone that would avail themselves of this opportunity to put on the Lord Jesus in baptism, to bring a prayer request before us, to remember them in their struggle and their need, perhaps a declaration of repentance and change. And at the singing of this invitation song, if that's you and we can help in any way, why not let us know now while we stand and as we sing together. Jesus is calling, calling, calling. Jesus is calling today. Why should we linger, linger, linger? I will arise and away. They are so happy, happy, happy. Who song this morning will be Father hear the prayer we offer we'll sing all four verses and then we'll have a prayer Father hear the prayer we Through endeavor, failure, 
path be bright or dreary, storm or sunshine be our share. May our souls in hope unweary make thy work our ceaseless prayer. Let's pray. Dear Father, you, you bless us every day and you sustain our lives. And Father, we pray that as we approach you uh, this morning in, in worship, that, that what we have done and said here is acceptable to you. Father, we pray that you would uh, be with all those that uh, have a, are experiencing loss at this time, those have a, that have lost loved ones. We pray that, that your comfort uh, and uh, and strength would be extended to them at this time. Father, we, we pray for uh, the, con the continued um, works of this congregation, that, that, uh, that the, uh, our efforts to reach out to, to, to those that are in the world uh, would, would be fruitful. And Father, we pray that you would be with all of us uh, uh, after our uh, our time at this in this building is done and we head home. We pray that you would uh, give us safe travel. Father, we pray that as we continue on through this week that you would uh, help us to, to, to be good and kind to each other, to do the things that, that, that you would have us do and to follow, follow the example of our, of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in, it's in his name we pray. Amen.